I did a video about two or three weeks ago on von Neumann's theory of economic growth. I did this because I had been asked by a viewer whether I could produce some videos on the Marxist theory of development and growth. Now, the von Neumann one was an introductory one. And it introduces some key concepts in Marxist economics, but there are weaknesses to it. And I'm going to show how the work of Kantorovich, who was writing in the 30s as well, can be used to overcome these. Now, remember the A matrix I introduced last video. It's a Technical, a description of the technical structure of the economy that's widely used in formal Marxist economics. Uh, it does, however, have certain weaknesses. It's a flow matrix. That is to say, it measures the quantity of a given input that is used each year or each time period. And therefore, it's the flow in and the flow out that is measured with the, by the A matrix. As such, it ignores stocks of fixed capital, only shows the flow of means of production, not the ones which are there and persist from time period to time period. The, another feature of the von Neumann one is that it treats labor or labor power just the same as any other commodity. There's a column in the matrix for the reproduction of labor power and each cell in that represents the consumption by workers of the, the goods, use values necessary to reproduce their labor power. The last thing is that the time period is ambiguous. This is something that people ask me about in comments and yes it is a problem with this it is a abstract representation of the problem and the the development of these models starts from abstract simple models and then you have to make them more complicated to deal with the concreteness of the real world now let's talk about the fact that it ignores fixed capital. The conceptual ma uh, origin of using this kind of matrix probably goes back to volume two of Capital, whose reproduction schemes can be seen as similar to a set of linear equations or a matrix op um, operation. And the reproduction schemes in Capital only deal with flows. Now that's fine for the purpose for which Marx was discussing in volume two, which he was discussing is how do the different classes of commodities that are produced have their value realized through sale. So the focus was very definitely on flows because he's concerned with sales each time period. But this is inadequate and you start looking at economic growth. Now, the, the time period is implicitly assumed to be a year. Why? Well, that goes back to the origins of formal treatment of, of reproduction, which was by the French physiocratic economists in the 18th century. And the most famous of this is the Tableau Economique of Kesney. And Marx's analysis was built on this, or at least was in this tradition. And Kesney did everything in terms of the year. Now, why does he do it in terms of the year? Well, it's because he's talking about the farming year. He's talking about what was in the 18th century a primarily agricultural economy where investment mainly takes the form of seed. Seeds are sown, 
they return with a surplus after the harvest and this physical surplus of seeds was seen by Kesne as the source of all surplus in the economy. Now in a sense he's right, in a limited sense he's right, in that without an agricultural surplus you cannot have an urban population. So the agricultural surplus does lie at the root of all other classes in society, as Kesne said. But this doesn't adequately take into account surplus value that exists in a capitalist economy, and it's an illustration of the fact that ideas are bounded by historical economic conditions. The theoretical concept of surplus that could be developed in the mid-18th century was bounded by the actual mode of production that existed at the time, which was an agricultural one. Now, industry is different. It's dominated by large, long-lived means of production. And the flow of new means of production each year is a small fraction of the stock that's being used. As a consequence, if you're using a simple matrix model like von Neumann, you've only got a first approximation to it. It doesn't really grasp the nature of the growth problem because it doesn't deal with this problem of long-lived means of production. And people are different too. If a year is reasonable in agriculture. It doesn't apply to humans. The reproduction of humans doesn't take place every year. The interval between generations is more like a quarter century. So the expanded reproduction of labour power, which is demanded in von Neumann's growth model, can't increase at a faster rate than the natural reproduction of human beings, which means the time period for the von Neumann model, if applied as a growth model, would have to be a quarter century. But that's not how the workforce actually grows during industrialization. In many early industrial economies, 19th century France let's say, a large part of the population is agriculture with low productivity. This is what Marx called the latent reserve army here. And there are lots of people not in formal employment in agriculture. There is chronic underemployment of the labour force people who potentially could work but can't be employed by lack of means of production. And Marx called this the stagnant reserve army. Now, in time, both of these were drawn into industry. In fact, if you're talking about France, it really takes until the middle of the 20th century, the late 50s, 1960s, before this is completed. The implications of this is that the labour force in industry can potentially grow much faster than the natural population increase. And the labour force in industry is actually constrained by the availability of modern means of production, both in the factories and on the land, since it's only tractors and combine harvesters replacing horsepower and manual labour that can free up the labour power in the the land. This of course was the major motivation for the Soviets setting up machine tractor stations and collectivizing to free up an agrarian population to become an industrial population. Now a bit before von Neumann the Russian economist Feldman developed a model which took all this into account and it was then independently discovered by an Indian economist Mahal Lanobis 
who worked on the Indian five-year plans. Now, what was the objective of the Feldman Mahanobis model? It's to raise the long-term production of industrial consumer goods. But it does this by initially giving priority to building up the stock of means of production. Um, the, the, if you recall Marx's reproduction schemes, the section of the economy that produces means of production he calls sector one. Now, let's see how we can modify what we had with von Neumann to illustrate the Feldman model. We previously had four rows and four columns, means of production, necessities, luxury, luxuries and labour power. But as I said, characteristic of a, a late pre-industrial, early industrial economy is that it has a large peasant agricultural sector alongside a small mechanised sector. So we need to split the agricultural sector into two parts mechanized agriculture and peasant agriculture and the peasant agriculture in this uh, uh, illustration uses 10 times as much labor as the mechanized agriculture and it uses only a fifth as much machinery or when I say machinery these are primitive tools more like rather than machinery So I've retained the same technology for the mechanised sector as I did before, but I, the peasant sector is less efficient, much less efficient. If we have two sectors producing the same product, you can't use a simple matrix structure, which von Neumann had. You need two matrices, a consumption matrix and a production matrix. So the consumption matrix is what I showed you earlier, how much is consumed in each sector. The P matrix says how much is produced in a given period of time in these sectors. So we see there are two sectors producing necessities. So to produce one unit of necessities in the mechanized farm so requires 0.3 units of labor. To produce one unit of necessities in the peasant farms reply, requires 0.3 units, not 0.03 units. And other than that, we have one song, the diagonal. So we've made the, the model more complicated by having two matrices. What does this imply? How are we going to model? the fixed capital stocks. Now the best method really is to have a further matrix K which specifies the stocks of each type of input required to produce one unit of output. But for explanatory purposes I'm going to use something simpler. I'm going to use Marx's idea of a turnover time by which he means the duration for which the value of means of production are tied up in production. If the turnover time is five years we need a stock of means of production that is five times the flow, shown in the A and C matrices. And I'm going to, in my explanation, I'm going to assume five years. If you've got a problem of this sort, where you've got multiple techniques producing the same output, and you have several time periods during which investment could take place, you can't solve it with the simple matrix techniques proposed by von Neumann. Instead, you need Kantorovich-style linear programming or some other constraint satisfaction algorithm. In our book, Towards a New Socialism, we propose a different constraint satisfaction algorithm. Now, let's look at the constraints that you have when you're trying to industrialize an economy. I'm going to assume a bounded population since the natural rate of population growth will be relatively slow and for simplicity I'm going to assume it's fixed. 
we start off with an inadequate stock of means of production for an industrial economy. But we need to ensure that enough necessities are produced each time period to feed the population. So you can't draw workers out of peasant agriculture too fast before you can mechanise it. We're assuming that the necessities and luxuries are consumed in the following period. So the necessities produced in year one are consumed in year two, etc. That's obviously true for actual harvests. And the capital stock, however, grows. So the capital stock in year N will be the new means of production produced in year N minus one plus the stock that existed in year N minus one minus any depreciation which occurs during one year. I am also going to assume from my worked examples that have a working population of 52 million people and an initial stock of means of production of 78 million units, whatever the physical units we're dealing with are. For this kind of um, problem, where we're going to use linear programming to come to the solution, but we start off with data in matrix form, I f prefer to write a program in a high level language which takes the matrix specification of the problem and prints it out as a series of um, linear constraints for LP solve. So I then pipe it through LP solve. Here's an example of what I would have. I have a program which generates the linear program called GenLP. I pipe it through LP solve and send the output to the results.txt. And the results look things like this, something like this. Year two, the output of labor, still 52 million. The output of luxuries is 5.2 million luxuries. Output of means of production, 37 million. Okay, so that, and the, you, you make up variable names to specify positions in the matrix since LP solve doesn't allow you to deal with matrices. Examples of constraints are easy to, to do. If you've got a, an A matrix or a, a C matrix, you can straightforwardly e express the inputs used as a linear function of the outputs being produced. So the outputs of means of production require you to have, uh, sorry, to produce, we know that to produce one output of means of production, you would use 1.6 or something inputs of means of production. So these are just re-expressing what's in your matrix in the first place, but expressing them as in constraints. Now, when we run this, what do we get? This shows your stock of means of production. As the plan goes on, the stock of means of production climbs up and plateaus. It can't grow indefinitely because we're assuming technology doesn't change and you've got a fixed population. So it'll grow until the maximum size of the, or maximum sustainable level of the means of production industry just reproduces the stock of means of production. But you don't stay at the maximum level because you don't want to produce just means of production. You want to increase the production of consumer goods. So you raise the level of means of production to a peak and then shrink that down once you've built up the stock needed for an industrial economy. And if you look at the implication for employment, the Peasant farms stay quite high 
peak us slightly. Why do they peak? Well, it's because actually the production of means of production in the input output table I've got requires some inputs from peasant agriculture. So we get a little peak of that at the point when production of means of production are at the highest. At that point, we're just undergoing the transition at which we can mechanize agriculture. In the Soviet Union, once they had built the tractor factories, they could then start collectivizing agriculture and having mechanized agriculture. So the employment and means producing means of production peaks, then levels off a bit, whilst production employment in peasant farms plummets, goes right down to zero. The mechanized farms are close to zero, then become the entire farming sector with far few people in it. At the same time, once we have enough means of production, you can absorb the latent reserve army in agriculture. The people were underemployed in agriculture. That was going back to the um, period of the 1960s with the communes in China. An aim was to have local industries which used up underused labour power in the countryside. So you get a decline in unemployment or underemployed labour in the ag in the agricultural sector and you are enabled to produce a rapid increase in the production of what I'm calling consumer luxuries but they're only luxuries from the viewpoint of peasant agriculture things which peasants couldn't have. Basically all outputs of mechanised industry, all consumer outputs of mechanised industry. So these then rise to a high plateau. And this is the transition that Feldman and Mahalanobis were talking about. It worked in the Soviet Union, didn't work in India because India hadn't had a thoroughgoing revolution and didn't have a fully socially planned economy. So what do we say from this? The conclusions are that you can use a linear programming model like this to show that Feldman was right. A country has got to first concentrate on expanding means of production. After that it can mechanise agriculture then it can expand the production of consumer luxuries. And that is the Feldman-Mahalnobis model of growth.